Hello and welcome to News News Live from Islamabad. I'm Jawad Tehami and these are the headlines. In Afghanistan, gunmen have killed 10 workers of an international landmine clearing charity and injured 16 others in northern Baghlan province. The Interior Ministry has accused the Taliban of carrying out the attacks, but the group has denied any involvement. Meanwhile, the Taliban claim to have seized the Chahi Aab district of Takhar province, causing heavy casualties to the military. The UN expert has warned of mass deaths from starvation and disease in Myanmar after attacks by the military forced thousands to flee their homes in Kaya State. In a statement, Tom Andrews called for urgent international action to save the lives of men, women and children. The country plunged into crisis after the military seized power in February. China has slammed the U.S. bill passed by its Senate to counter Beijing's technological advancement. In a statement, China's parliament opposed the measure, saying it displayed a Cold War mentality. It said the bill smeared China's domestic and foreign policies and is an interference in its internal affairs. Pakistan has reached a landmark figure of administering 10 million COVID-19 vaccine doses. The country has registered 77 new deaths and just over 1,100 infections in the past 24 hours. Meanwhile, in India, the COVID-19 has claimed over 2,200 more lives, while infecting more than 92,000 overnight. Globally, more than 3.7 million people have died from the virus and over 173 million have been infected so far. Those were the headlines and detailed stories right after a short break. Stay tuned. Welcome back and now for the news in detail. In Afghanistan's northern Baghlan province, gunmen have killed 10 workers of an international landmine clearing charity and injured 16 others. The Interior Ministry has accused the Taliban of carrying out the attack in the Baghlan a Markazi district of the province. However, the group has condemned the attack, denying any involvement. Earlier, the Taliban claimed to have shot down a military helicopter in Medan Vardak province, killing all on board. The Defence Ministry cited technical issues as the reason behind the helicopter crash, saying three crew members have been killed and one other wounded. The Taliban also claimed to have conquered the Cha-e-Ab district of Thakur province, causing heavy casualties to the military. The Taliban spokesman added they have attacked Afghan forces in Khost province, leaving 25 security personnel dead. The government did not comment on the Taliban's claim. The UN expert has warned of mass deaths from starvation and disease in Myanmar after attacks by the military forced thousands to flee their homes in Kaya state. In a statement, Tom Andrews called for urgent international action to save the lives of men, women and children against the military's indiscriminate attacks. The plea came hours after the UN office in Myanmar said the violence in Kaya had displaced an estimated 100,000 people. Myanmar's army has struggled to impose order since seizing power and detaining elected leader Aung San Suu Kyi and other party figures. Uh, rights groups say security forces have killed 857 people so far. China has slammed the U.S. bill passed by its Senate to counter Beijing's technological advancement. In a statement, China's parliament opposed the measure, saying it displayed a Cold War mentality. It said the bill smeared China's domestic and foreign policies and is an interference in its internal affairs. Earlier, the 100-member U.S. Senate voted 68 to 32 to pass the legislation. It prohibits the download of social media app TikTok and blocks the purchase of China-manufactured drones. The bill must now pass House of Representatives before being signed into law by President Joe Biden. 
Syrian army's air defense system has intercepted an Israeli missile strike over the capital Damascus. State media says the Israeli army launched the attack from over the Lebanese territory. It said the strike caused only material damage. Some Syrian state media outlets said the strikes hit Homs province near Lebanon. The Israeli military has not commented on the matter so far. Israeli forces have arrested 12 Palestinians and shot three others across the occupied West Bank. One of the wounded in Toba city sustained life-threatening injuries. The Ume Safa village council said Israeli forces raided various areas, smashed doors and ransacked houses. Earlier Israeli soldiers bulldozed large areas of Palestinians' agricultural lands in the Nablus city to expand an illegal colony. Protests erupted after several army jeeps invaded the area and ransacked homes. Israeli troops fired a barrage of live rounds, rubber-coated bullets and gas bombs at the protesters in the city. Iraq has released an Iran-aligned militia commander after authorities found insufficient evidence against him. Security forces arrested Qasim Musleh on terrorism-related charges last month from the southern city of Karbala. Officials said at the time, the arrest was linked to attacks on U.S. forces stationed in Iraq. His release without prosecution comes as a blow to Iraq's efforts to crack down on armed groups. Musli commands the Popular Mobilization Forces in Amber province and leads his own faction within the organization. U.S. President Joe Biden has extended sanctions against Belarus by another year. The curbs target and Belarusian officials and bar Americans from engaging in any transactions with them. The White House says Belarus's actions pose an extraordinary threat to U.S. national security and foreign policy. Biden slammed Minsk for committing human rights abuses and engaging in public corruption. He said such actions undermine democratic processes and institutions. Meanwhile, President Alexander Lukashenko has signed a law to prison those who insult or protest against the state officials. In India, the COVID-19 has claimed over 2,200 more lives while infecting more than 92,000 in the past 24 hours. Globally, more than 3.7 million people have died from the virus and over 173 million have been infected so far. More than this report. As the developing nations struggle to fund COVID-19 inoculations, the World Bank has ruled out support for waiving intellectual property rights for COVID-19 vaccines to help reduce the cost of fighting the pandemic. This comes as World Trade Organization member nations are taking up a proposal to ease patent protections for vaccines. In the U.S., authorities are scrambling to extend the shelf life of Johnson & Johnson's vaccine as millions of unused surplus doses approach expiration. The country has also eased travel recommendations for more than 110 countries and territories, including Japan, just ahead of the Olympics. In Mexico, students in capital Mexico City returned to school as COVID-19 cases and deaths dip to lowest levels in over a year. It is a challenge. We have to re-educate our children who used to hug each other and share everything, even food. Today, they cannot share their pencils, their notebook. They cannot give their classmates even a taste of their sandwiches. We all have to learn that this is a new normality. Things have changed. Uruguay has released data on the impact of Sinovac vaccine that showed it was more than 90% effective. Over in the UK, the number of COVID-19 cases in the past week has increased by 60% as compared to the previous week. German Chancellor Angela Merkel has called on the world to learn from the corona crisis to work in a more sustainable manner. Das verlangt, dass wir schon jetzt this requires us thinking about life after corona, moving out of corona crisis sustainably, as they call it. This means that we must not content ourselves with somehow returning to pre-corona situation. We must do everything by using economic and social recovery to live and work more innovatively, more digitally, more resiliently, more environment friendly and in short, more sustainably. Meanwhile, South Africa has put its health minister on special leave over alleged links to a corruption scandal involving coronavirus funding. In African countries, thousands of vaccine doses have been destroyed as they exceeded expiry dates amid lack of medical infrastructure. 
Pakistan has reached the landmark figure of administering 10 million COVID-19 vaccine doses. A ceremony was held in Islamabad to mark the deliverance of the 10 millionth dose. Speaking at the ceremony, Planning Minister Asaduma said the government aims to vaccinate 70 million people by the end of this year. Umar urged people to get inoculated, saying a high number of vaccinated people offer better overall protection against the virus. Pakistan's coronavirus positivity rate has dropped to 2.54 percent, the lowest this year. The health ministry reported just over 1,100 cases and 77 deaths over the past 24 hours. The country's death toll now stands at 21,453, with 936,000 confirmed cases. China has once again lauded Pakistan's efforts for bringing peace and stability to the region, including Afghanistan. The acknowledgement came during a meeting of Chinese Ambassador Nong Rong with Pakistan's Army Chief General Kamajaved Bajwa in Rawalpindi. According to Milleries Media Wing, the two sides discussed progress on the China-Pakistan economic corridor and latest developments in the Afghan peace process. It said the Army Chief thanked the envoy for the provision of coronavirus vaccines to Pakistan. The death toll from the train accident in the Sindh province has risen to 66. Over 100 injured people are under treatment at different hospitals and many of them are critical. Officials fear that the death toll may rise. The accident occurred when a passenger train smashed into detailed carriages of another train near Ghotki city on Monday. Initial reports cited the broken welding joint of the track as the cause of the collision. In Indian-occupied Kashmir, a 70-year-old Rohingya woman has died after being in police custody since March. The woman has been identified as Noor Aisha, who was detained in Jammu's Hiranagar jail. She was among 200 Rohingya refugees who were detained in March from their camps in Jammu. Authorities say they would be deported to Myanmar. The action was drawn, has rather drawn a widespread condemnation from activists and human rights groups. The Royal Saudi Land Forces have launched a joint exercise with the U.S. forces in Saudi Arabia's northwestern region. In a statement, the Saudi Defense Ministry said the Falcon Clause 4 aimed to strengthen mutual military relations. They said the exercises will unify military concepts through joint action between the forces of both states. The exercises also aim to exchange military information and experiences, improve compatibility between military equipment and doctrines. The U.S. says Iran's, Iran's rather non-cooperation with a U.N. nuclear watchdog will jeopardize the 2015 nuclear deal revival talks in Vienna. In a statement to the agency's Board of Governors, Washington urged Iran to let the watchdog continue its monitoring activities unhindered. Meanwhile, diplomats said a number of outstanding issues continue delaying U.S. return to the JCPOA and Tehran's full compliance. Earlier, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken said sanctions on Iran may remain in place even if the deal is revived. Testifying before a Senate committee, Blinken also said that Iran needs to change its behavior. Moreover, the potential change of Iranian leadership after June 18 presidential election are also expected to present challenges to the talks. However, an Iranian presidential spokesperson has declared that Iran's nuclear talks policy won't change after the vote. Iran says the peace processes in war-torn countries must be owned by their people without external imposition. Foreign Minister Jabazari made these remarks after his meeting with UN Special Representatives on Afghanistan and Yemen. In a tweet, Zarif said he held fruitful talks with Jean Ochno and Martin Griffiths. He said that Iran seeks peace and stability in the region and is ready to facilitate it. Zarif said the crisis in Yemen can only be resolved through a diplomatic approach. More stories to follow over right after a short break. Stay tuned.
Welcome back. Beijing has criticized Japan and Australia for playing up the China threat and smearing it maliciously. In a press briefing, a foreign ministry spokesperson urged all the sides to stop interfering in China's internal affairs. Wang Wenbin also called in Tokyo and Canberra to stop sabotaging regional peace and stability. This comes after Australia and Japan demanded the access of international observers to Xinjiang. Meanwhile, Canberra has called for a binding dispute settlement system at the World Trade Organization. Prime Minister Scott Morrison said this is important to address economic coercion. Australia is looking to win the support of the G7 nations in its dispute with China. U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris says the root causes of migration in Central America will not be fixed overnight. She was talking to reporters at the end of a two-day trip to Guatemala and Mexico. Kamala Harris called for deeper engagement to address why people choose to leave their home countries. Earlier, Harris and Mexican President Andre Manuel Lopez Obrador agreed to deepen economic ties. Harris and Lopez Obrador also witnessed the signing of an MOU on development agencies working in Central America. The accord is aimed at reducing the number of migrants from Central American countries to the U.S. through Mexico. The meeting follows Harris's Monday visit to Guatemala, where she met President Alejandro Giametai. In India, at least 17 people have died after a bus collided with a loader vehicle in the northern state of Uttar Pradesh. Police say many others were injured in the accident. They say the speeding bus overturned and fell into a ditch in Kanpur Nagar district near Lucknow. Authorities say the passengers got trapped in the wreckage holding the rescue process. They said the bus from Lucknow was en route to Delhi and carried laborers. Thousands of Canadians have held vigils to remember a Muslim family killed in London, Ontario. Four people were run over by a truck in a premeditated hate crime. The victims included three women and a man, while the child remains hospitalized with serious injuries. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau joined the mourners as a grieving community stood united amid the crisis. Addressing the mourners in London, Trudeau vowed to take action to dismantle far-right groups. There are no words that can undo the pain and, yes, the anger of this community. There are no words that can fix the future of that little boy who has had his future taken away. But know this, you are not alone. All Canadians mourn with you and stand with you tonight and always. The Hong Kong team behind celebrity humanoid robot Sophia is launching a new prototype, Grace. It is designed to interact with the elderly and those isolated by the COVID-19 pandemic. What in this report? Hi, Grace. Thank you, Sophia. Dressed in a blue nurse's uniform, Grace has Asian features, color-length brown hair, and a thermal camera to take your temperature and measure your responsiveness. She uses artificial intelligence to diagnose a patient and can speak English, Mandarin, and Cantonese. Let's, uh, let's see what your smile looks like. Okay, yeah. Look, or sad. Oh, yes. I can do all kinds of things for elderly people. I can visit with people and brighten their day with social stimulation, entertain and help guide exercise, but also can do talk therapy, take bio readings and help healthcare providers assess their health and deliver treatments. Grace's resemblance to a healthcare professional and capacity for social interaction is aimed at relieving the burden of frontline hospital staff overwhelmed during the pandemic. Such a socially isolated individuals during COVID with a lot of, uh, you know, negative uh, thoughts and their mental states, you know, if they can get help through uh, deployment of these social robots in their, uh, you know, intimate settings, I think it certainly it has a positive impact in the society. So, yeah, so I think uh, we have been fundamentally and forever changed as a world due to COVID.
Awakening Health has announced mass production of a beta version of Grace by August. Officials say the cost of making the robot, now akin to luxury car pricing, will decrease once the company is manufacturing tens or hundreds of thousands of units. And other business updates, China's factory gate prices for goods have increased at their fastest pace since September 2008. Data from the National Bureau of Statistics shows the producer price index surged 9% year-on-year in May. The figure beats the average of an 8.2% increase forecast. Beijing's PPI had already been higher than expected year-on-year -year increase of 6.8% in April. The surge in index follows recovering domestic and global demand. Meanwhile, the Consumer Price Index also posted a year-on-year -year increase of 1.3% in May. However, it fell short of the market estimation of 1.6%. The leaders of the European Union and the U.S. are set to commit to lifting steel tariffs before December 1 this year. The draft statement prepared for a June 15 summit in Brussels aims to avoid any further transatlantic trade disputes. The draft also commits to ending a long-running spat over subsidies to aircraft makers before July 11. The U.S. imposed a record $7.5 billion in tariffs on European goods in October 2019. EU retaliated by slapping $4 billion in tariffs on U.S. goods in November last year. A Paris court has indicted French car maker Renault for deception of a diesel emissions probe launched in 2017. The investigation followed a report pointing out high level of emissions in violation with the Euro standards. The court directed Renault to pay a deposit of 20 million euros, including 18 million for damages and fines. It also asked the group to provide a bank guarantee of 60 million euros in cash as compensation. The auto giant refuted the indictment, saying its vehicles comply with approved laws and regulations. Several car makers in Europe have come under scrutiny since the Volkswagen Dieselgate scandal. Gulf stock markets have risen as the increase in oil prices with merger and acquisition deals provided an additional boost to the markets in the UAE and Bahrain. Oil prices rose for the second session on signs of strong fuel demand in Western economies, but the prospect of Iranian supplies returning faded as the U.S. Secretary of State said sanctions against Tehran were unlikely to be lifted. Saudi Arabia's benchmark index gained close to half a percent. Stocks in Bahrain also increased over half a percent. Abu Dhabi National Hotels Company jumped nearly 15 percent. In Dubai, the index gained marginally, while well, Qatar's index edged up fractionally. Another weather situation from around the globe. That is all for now. For the latest updates, you can follow us on social media at Interstock News.